this evening. Um, this is an opportunity for the members of the Seneca community and the members of the uh, XORG developers community to, um, to get together to learn uh, about the, particularly about the X developers community. Hopefully, um, the X developers can learn a bit about Seneca as well. And um, so I thank you very much for attending, regardless of which side you're from. Um, just a brief word about the two communities. Uh, the X developers community is one of the oldest, and I can't call it free software or open source communities because it predates both of those terms. It's, it's one of the oldest uh, sort of free software open source projects and is the foundation of the graphic system for, for many, many operating systems. Uh, the Seneca community is here from Seneca College. We have been involved in open source in various ways over the past couple of decades. And we've grown over the past uh, 12 years or so a center for development of open technology. And we work in that center um, and take from that center knowledge and take that into our courses and so forth, uh, working with a wide number of, of open source projects, uh, Mozilla, uh, Linux on ARM, uh, Graphics Work, WebGL, many, many other projects as well. Um, I would invite you, if you're not familiar with the, the workings of CDOT, to take a look at cdot.senecacollege.ca. Uh, and regardless of which community you're from, I would like to invite you to uh, the Free Software and Open Source Symposium, which is coming up in uh, just over a month's time. And this is a sort of eclectic open source conference that we have here at Seneca. So the format for this evening, uh, I think, is two parts, basically. Uh, at the beginning, we're going to have a talk from uh, Keith Packard, who is one of the earliest, one, one of the longest standing members of the, uh, the XORG community, the I would the say. The longest standing. I would say uh, <laughs> the longest standing, okay. Um, and so he'll give a presentation about that community, then we'll have a round table session, and hopefully if time permits at the end, we'll have uh, some Q&A. So um, thank you very much for, Keith, and for How long uh, are we here in this room till? We have the room till, uh, seven. Okay. Guaranteed. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thanks. Well, thanks for inviting me to speak to you all today. Uh, my name is Keith Packard, as Chris has said. I've been working in the uh, X Window System world for a while. Um, I'm a s currently a senior software engineer at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, currently called HP. In about a month, it'll change its name. Um, I have been um, doing free software for a very long time. How many of you were alive in 1987? <laughs> yeah, see, all the ex-developers and none of the students. <laughs> yeah. Um, the f I, worked in, I worked with Unix um, on PDP-11 and VAX computers starting in 1981. Um, I did graphics development on VAX computers starting in 1978. Um, so I've been doing uh, free and open source software and uh, Unix sort of stuff for the better part of my life. Um, the first contributions I did to free software were actually um, to GDB and GCC. Um, I worked on uh, GDB, GDB and GCC support for a processor made by National Semiconductor, the 16032, uh, which has blessedly died uh, since then. Um, I started in X development in about 1987. I worked at the MIT X consortium from uh, 1988 uh, to uh, 1992. Um, uh, 2002, yeah, that's really good. No, I was only there till 1992. I'm sorry about the typo in there. Um, I'm currently a member of the X.org Foundation Board. Uh, that's the foundation that oversees this particular conference and the financial and community aspects of the X window system development. Um, I'm the director of the freedesktop.org foundation. I've been a Debian developer since 2004. How many of you, how many you, of you use the Debian operating system? <laughs> what do you use now? You changed? I don't think I ever used it that much. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, not very many Debian developers here. That's, that's the largest uh, Linux distribution um, around. It forms the basis of many other Linux distributions like Ubuntu and Mint. So if you use either of those Linux distributions, you're actually mostly using Debian. Um, and I'm a member of the technical committee of that. Uh, what is X? X is a window system. Uh, what does a window system do? It has two really simple jobs. It multiplexes applications onto one screen so that a single user can see multiple applications at a time. 
Um, and it demultiplexes the user's intention uh, to those applications. So the user can type or use the mouse and have those, uh, that stuff sent to the And that's all the Windows system does. Um, if a Windows system is doing more than that, it's not just a Windows system. Um, the X Windows system is also a free software project. Um, it uses the MIT license, which is similar to the BSD license. Um, uh, my f my, my uh, friends from the BSD world like to call the GPL the copy left license and the proprietary license the copy right license. And they like to call the MIT or BSD license the copy center license which is to say you can take the source code down and cop and to the copy center and copy it as much as you like. Um, and the uh, x window system is also a community. And we've been in a community since about 1987 of developers and corporations and users um, and testers and people who write about us. Um, it's a, it's a, pretty big, a pretty big group of people. Um, so here's the early history of X. This is the first computer that X ran on. Uh, not this particular computer. I don't have a picture of that one. It's at MIT. It's, I'm sure it's long since been scrapped from MIT. But it was a VAX 11750, a 32-bit microcontroller, uh, microcomputer or mini computer rather, uh, from the 1980s and 70s uh, that ran uh, an, that ran BSD Unix. Um, it was a, it was uh, this particular machine typically had about a megabyte of RAM. Um, it had disks that were on the order of 100 to 200 megabytes. Um, and it had a processor that ran at a steaming about a million instructions per second. So we called that the 3M computer. A megabyte of memory at a million instructions per second, and it had a bitmap display of about a million pixels. Um, the bitmap display in this case was called the VS100. It was uh, connected to the Unibus through a nice big card. Um, so this is where X came from. <laughs> it was originally not designed to work on, on tiny computers at all. Um, so what the, how did the X... Uh, X system get uh, started in its current incarnation. Well, the MIT X consortium uh, was hosted at MIT's uh, Laboratory for, C for Computer Science. And why did it? Why did we have a consortium that was hosted within a Laboratory for Computer Science with a bunch of people working for that consortium uh, to do X development? Well, it turns out that in 1987 the internet died. It became literally unusable because the retransmit protocol, the retransmit policies of the pre Van Jacobson era, uh, made, meant that when that when any transmission started to fail a little bit, you got a million additional packets onto the internet. So the internet was literally not usable during the daytime. There'd be so much garbage on the internet you couldn't use it. And so we were trying to do X development at the time with a team in Palo Alto and a team in North Carolina and a team in Massachusetts. And we were literally having to FedEx mag tapes across the country to transfer the source code because the internet was not functional in 1987. So everybody said, oh, I know what we should do. We should fix this by moving all the developers into one location so we don't have this problem, right? What we, what we should have realized was, oh, wait, we just need to wait for the internet to get fixed and we can continue doing this very successful development model. And so we applied the wrong fix. Uh, put together an industry consortium funded by massive donations from corporate interests uh, with a staff dedicated to X development. Um, hired developers. I was one of the developers that worked there. And we worked in this building, which is uh, 545 Tech Square. Um, it's since been renumbered to 200 something. I don't know what it is now. Uh, but we worked on the second floor in the left hand side of the building um, in three tiny little offices. And there were about six of us. Uh, we had uh, most of the major Unix workstation vendors of the time as members of that consortium. Apollo, Digital, um, let's see, uh, Tektronix, uh, HP, all these companies that uh, don't really make uh, workstation computers anymore. Um, SGI was a member, uh, Apple was a member, all kinds of strange companies. Uh, basically people working on Unix. And they all paid between five dollars and $50,000 a year for the privilege of being able to help guide and, and, and control the X-Window system. Uh, here's what X looked like at the time. Um, you, the awesome part, so one of the awesome parts about X is that this is, this is all of those old applications, right? All these old applications, X-Man and the X-Logo and all this stuff. These applications were written in like 1988. And one of the powers of X is that these applications still work today. So we haven't broken compatibility. We're more compatible, we have more backward compatibility than any other uh, graphics system on the planet. Right? We have, we're able to run 30, literally 30-year-old 30 applications, probably twice some of your age. 
Um, and it's, it was designed to run on black and white and limited color uh, terminals. Jamie, you had a question? Uh, yes, I think it does actually say MacBook. Yeah. I don't know where, what the screenshot is from, but uh, so this was my color theme from uh, the TWM window manager that I put together. Um, and that became the standard TWM color theme because when you're at the X consortium, you get to set the standard like this. And so all, almost all screenshots of X from the era have my TWM theme in them. Yeah? What's the T stand for? Uh, Tom's window manager. Uh, Tom, what is his last name? I have, I have forgotten his name. He's now a, a venture capitalist guy. Um, so he's kind of moved on from X. Uh, some of us <laughs> never escape. Yeah, so this is what, and this is the kind of computers that it was originally really designed to work on. This is a Sun 380 workstation. Um, this is a, a Motorola 68020 based machine. It probably had two megabytes of memory. And you can see it had a color screen. That was, that was the hot stuff back then. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I just remember the the the, the 360. Um, it had a three-button mouse. It had to run on a special pad because it was optical. So when you wanted an optical mouse in 1989, you had to have a special thing that had cross lines going in both directions so the optical sensor could track it. What? <laughs> there is your. No, I, I bet that's more than a hundred dollars. <laughs> Yeah, we were, we were talking about $100 mouse today. It's like, how could you spend $100 on a mouse? Well, apparently, yeah, you could back then. Yeah, you still can if you want to. Yeah. The other thing that X was, one of the interesting things is that X created an entire industry, the X terminal industry. Um, these were tiny little ROM-based devices that ran an X server but no applications. So this is kind of like a Chromebook in a lot of ways in that it doesn't run any local applications. Um, and this is kind of the genesis of that very dumb graphics environment um, and kind of a follow-on from the IBM uh, 3270 sort of era. This would run X applications over the network. Um, and uh, places like Toyota, Toyota, every single Toyota dealership on the planet had X terminals in their parts department because all of their parts applications were X applications running in some back office in Poughkeepsie or something. I don't know where. And so you go into it, you'd, I'd, I'd wander into my Toyota dealership to buy parts for my car, and it's like, oh, I built that. <laughs> it was kind of cool. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't admit it. I'm not that stupid. <laughs> Okay, so X was taken over by a bunch of moneyed corporate interests in about 1988, um, and they decided that what they wanted to do was I embrace ex and then extend um, and extinguish, and they managed to do all three. Um, unfortunately, they extinguished themselves. Um, they developed a bunch of proprietary software on top of X, um, and so they built two separate, completely separate um, proprietary environments that could both run on X. So X was successfully compatible and you could run Sun applications or OpenLook applications on a DEC workstation and you could run CDE or DEC applications on a Sun workstation. But other than that, they tried to make sure that they looked completely different. So this is the, this is the uh, common desktop environment. Um, it was, it was, it was uh, built by a group of companies that were basically everybody except Sun. Um, and they built this thing. Um, note the cool 3D effect of these. This was, this was the innovation of the decade. The notion of using different, different shades of the same color to create this raised and, oh, in the embossed effect, that was, when we first saw that, that was amazing. It's like, wow, that is so cool. <laughs> yep. So at, in that era, all the workstation vendors forked the X server. They all copied the X server code from MIT, made their own proprietary changes, and shipped it. Nobody shipped any of the changes back. So every workstation vendor had their own custom X server. It was awesome. All the drivers, of course, were closed source. Uh, Sun built a bunch of proprietary hardware to accelerate X uh, on, the, on the GX graphics displays. Um, and it took me <clears throat> like three weeks of bitter time to reverse engineer it all. <laughs> Uh, talk to the guys who reverse engineer graphics chips today. It's, it's on the order of years. But back then, you could actually reverse engineer the silicon in a couple of weeks. It was kind of amazing. Um, <clears throat> 
the common desktop environment, the people managed to build this standard called XT, and they were trying to push Sun out of the market. It was bitter. Um, and the re end result of this was because all these companies were desperately trying to partition the market and keep the customers to themselves, they ended up imploding the entire Unix workstation market. Who here has ever used a Unix workstation? Yeah, all the old X developers. Um, and why did they die? Well, they died because they were greedy, right? Like corporations are supposed to be. Um, the, some of this code remained closed source for years and years, even after people continued to use it. Um, so here's the, the Sun version. This is called OpenLook. I preferred the look of OpenLook to, to uh, the CDE stuff. I thought the colors were a little nicer, and it looked a little nicer on my eyes. Um, all this text, of course, is not any aliased. You can't see any of that. It all, it's all, to a modern eye, this is like, you've got to be kidding. This is what you were using. Um, Sun decided to take it one step further. They actually created a whole new proprietary window system in this era called NEWS, the Network Extensible Window System which lets you dump programs over the link in PostScript, a fine programming language, into the Windows system server and execute them there. Uh, it never went anywhere. It was an abysmal failure. Sun tried to save face for a couple years. They made a combined X News server. Uh, so, and that was like, OK, so you're pretending that news is still relevant, whatever. Um, it all died eventually. Um, and in the 90s, as, you, as many of us remember, we thought that the Unix desktop was dead. There was not going to be a Unix desktop. We were going to be stuck running Windows forever, because that was what existed then. Um, so in the late 90s, well, actually the early 90s, this group X486 got started. Uh, they're kind of the rebel alliance. They were thinking, hey, I know. Let's take these cheap Intel and AMD-based uh, PCs that are running Unix-like operating systems, and we'll run X on them. So what did the X consortium do? The X consortium, of course, welcomed this with them with open arms and said, please come and play in our nice collaborative community. Not so much. They said, what? You're, you're not paying us giant gobs of money, and you're running things on computers that we aren't selling you? Go away. And so the X386 people went off and did their own development for a very long time and did a whole bunch of really cool work getting X running very effectively on Unix-based machines running on x86 processors. Um, they worked with the most nightmarish graphics cards on the planet. Uh, they worked with Unix vendors. Well, they didn't work with. They worked against the Unix vendors that were totally hostile to this idea. Um, but they were actually getting X running on a huge amount of hardware. And they were, they were completely locked out of the consortium process. At one point, they actually joined the consortium as an as a organizational member for like 5,000 bucks, uh, thinking that they would then you know, be welcomed into the club. Yeah, they were still, still ostracized. Um, uh, and uh, as a result of X486's work, um, uh, a little company called uh, Trolltech uh, put together a toolkit called QT in the, in the, in the mid-90s. I don't know when exactly they started, like 91. But it kind of started becoming real in the mid to late 90s. And they ru were running this QT toolkit on these X systems running on Unix-based x86 PCs. And this group in Germany decided, hey, we have a toolkit. It's all available in source code. It's not free software, but at least we can get the source code to it. Let's play and write applications that run on our cool computers. Um, it formed the, so the QT toolkit formed the basis of the original KDE desktop environment. And this was really, this, I mean, this is a seminal moment, moment for the modern Linux desktop. This is when people said, oh, wait a minute. We have now replaced all of the proprietary software in our old Unix desktops. We now have a completely free desktop environment. Now, the, the QT toolkit wasn't free software. It had some licensing restrictions and domain of use restrictions, but at least you had the source code and people could widely distribute it. Um, and in a similar time frame, just after that, uh, a, a group of people wrote an application called the GIMP, which is the GNU Image Manipulation Program. Um, and in order to do that, they wrote a bunch of you know, buttons and scroll bars and that kind of stuff, effectively a toolkit. Uh, so a bunch of other hackers, uh, started by Miguel de Casa uh, down in Mexico City, took bits out of that application, constructed a toolkit called GTK, and then started building a desktop around that. Why did they do this? Well, they did this because Qt wasn't actually free software, and they wanted a completely free, uh, free software environment. And from that, they actually started 
uh, building applications in an entire desktop, and from that we got GNOME. So within the span of a couple of years, we, we, went, to have it, we went from having all proprietary software for our Unix desktops, you know, CDE or OpenLook, uh, to having not one but two completely free software uh, desktop environments, which was pretty cool. Uh, the GNOME stuff is all now published, uh, has always been published under the GPL and LGPL, and now KDE and uh, the QT is also available under, under share alike licenses, which is pretty cool. Um, so in the meantime, uh, I went back to, I went to HP um, and we started doing some research on some smaller systems. Uh, those are AAA batteries. So this was built in, I'm trying to remember, I think this was built in like 1999 or 2000. Yeah, you remember this. I have one of these. So it's, it's, it, was, it was a miracle of the time. You could build a complete Linux computer with an ARM processor that you could hold in your hand and run on AAA batteries in like 1999. Who would have thought? And so what Windows system did this run? Well, of course, it ran X because it ran Linux. Um, and so I ported X to this device and played at the, uh, at the Compact Research Place for quite a while doing Windows systems on this and smaller devices. Oh, I don't think I put a picture of the IBM watch. Anybody ever seen the original IBM Linux watch? That was about 2001, 2002. That also ran X. And that was something that could fit on your wrist. That was like, oh my god, we are in the future. Flying cars are any day now. <laughs> <laughs> Compact, yeah, it was originally DEC, and then Compact bought DEC. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yes, Western Research Laboratory. Yep. Yep. Uh, and SRC. There were people from SRC working on it as well, because they knew how to do some of the some of the more nitty gritty electronics parts. Yep. Yeah, we and we built the cases for these in the machine shop at, at Whirl. It was kind of fun. So this was this is you know. Early maker, early maker dumb. The other thing that X, uh, X got ported to in this era was bigger systems. So this is a wall-sized uh, wall computer um, with a uh, gigapixel in like 2002, something like that. So that's the front of it. Here's what it looks like from the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that the one that's the, all the projectors? Yeah, you can see these are all projectors. So imagine a room full of like 50 of these projectors. And an enormous air conditioner. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we actually did a bunch of automatic alignment stuff that, to make it all possible. And you can see they all have these little shutters around them to make sure that they project just to their area on the screen. Oh my God, yeah. So this is at Princeton, and uh, they built uh, this gigapixel. I remember actually looking at the Hubble Deep Field image on this particular projector, and it was kind of magical because you could see individual stars. Um, you know, at just this huge density, it was really cool. So having a gigapixel for a monitor, yeah, I want one of those, um, except I don't want to build it like this. <laughs> what a mess. Uh, so what is the XORG Foundation uh, today? Uh, so uh, when X386 kind of imploded in 2002, we put together an XORG Foundation, and the real goal for this was just community gov governance of X. We didn't want to do anything about technical guidance. The community was doing a fine job doing code development and collaborating with one another, so we wanted a place uh, to actually do things like fun conferences, uh, fun developers uh, from college. So if you guys are interested in joining the, the, uh, the Google Summer of Code project, or the X.org Endless Vacation of Code. Uh, those, are funded out, those are funded and managed by the X.org Foundation. Um, our goal is to reduce barriers to collaboration, uh, encourage, encourage collaboration, and uh, as Peter said earlier today, uh, the X.org Foundation has absolutely no guidance over the technical direction of the X-Window system. It exists purely in a supportive role. So if somebody has a problem in the technology and wants to complain about uh, complain about why did you use int instead of long in that particular API. This is not the organization you complain to. They will not answer your questions. Um, uh, and in the 2000s, uh, X has started to do some pretty crazy things. So here's a Windows system developed by Alan Kay of uh, Smalltalk fame. It's actually written in Smalltalk um, and a bunch of his friends um, called uh, Croquet. And it's actually an immersive multi-user 3D environment. You can walk through this environment on your screen and navigate with these things. There's actually an X chess program up there painted on the wall of a, of a thing inside the, inside the application. Um, that took some hacking 
and got us to thinking. Um, oh, I was right. It was started actually by David Smith. Um, so this started before kind of the modern uh, X rewriting. A bunch of the X rewriting happened. Um, uh, and it kind of led to this notion that, oh, wait a minute. We can actually start hacking on X again. We got a bunch of, we got three, two completely competent desktop environments. We've got a bunch of Linux people that need this stuff. And so we went and wrote a whole bunch of new extensions and got a whole bunch of new cool functionality working. And that led to a whole bunch of new desktop environments. Here's one that Sun did called Looking Glass. Um, this was, you know, when we first saw this, this was like, oh my god, this is, again, you know, we are already driving our flying cars. Uh, we have 3D applications, and this is a regular X application being painted obliquely. I mean, is that cool or what? Um, and the, this cool little CD chooser, that was the, that, I think that was the, the uh, Looking Glasses guy's favorite UI. Completely, completely implausible, but really pretty. Um, and what all those extensions let us do was build completely new desktop environments. So here's the, uh, the current GNOME 3 desktop environment. As you can see, applications can get resized. They're translucent. Um, you have all kinds of animations on the screen, which you can't see here because it's a static image. Um, but it's kind of a modern, um, a modern user interface. Here's the new KDE environment. Uh, again, the drop shadows, translucent applications, all kinds of fun animations, pretty colors. Um, so what are we doing today? Well, and today we're doing we're we're taking our existing Xcode, we're rewriting big pieces of it again, because uh, that's what we do all the time. That's what, uh, we love to hack on the code. Uh, we're changing all the we uh, recently kind of rewrote the entire Linux support for graphics. Uh, so starting about ten years ago, we said, wait a minute, Linux really supports or, uh, really sucks for graphics support. So we actually spent a bunch of years completely replacing the internals of the Linux kernel and all of its graphics support. Um, now we have the ability to actually write X in a way that doesn't care what hardware you're running on. So actually, actually X is becoming all that hardware dependency that used to be the basis of all those uh, Unix vendors' proprietary X servers. All that's getting pushed out of X and into the underlying operating system. And that's been pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so I have, uh, I have a, le little less, a list of lessons that we've mostly learned, some of us better than others. Um, one of the things that I've certainly learned in the last 30 years is that GPL or share alike licenses are way better than BSD licenses. If you're developing software, you want to look, look and think very hard about your licensing. I have some real reasons why, BS, why GPL licenses are better. Uh, GPL is kind of the anti-hoarding license. So if you are a net contributor of code, be, a, be it an in, in individual or a corporation, the GPL license means that anybody who takes your code and improves it has to give their changes back. So even a net contributor of code to a project like OpenStack produces maybe you know, 20 or 30% of the total code base. The, uh, that other 80% of the code base, the only way you're going to get those changes back into your code in order to benefit you from your contributions is by using a share alike license. Um, uh, oh, although if you talk to some corporations, if you're a net consumer of code, you really want the code that other people produce to be based on a BSD license so that you can take that code in, make changes, and not have to share any of your work outside. So, if you, it, so you can tell which corporations are net consumers and which corporations are net producers of code. So a net consumer wants the BSD license, a net producer or somebody who's contributing to free software wants a uh, GPL-like license, which is why HP, where I currently work, uh, we prefer the GPL license for most of our software. Um, the other thing we've learned is that network-based collaboration actually works. Um, we developed the entire X11 system and all the previous uh, 10 versions uh, in a collaborative uh, a networked environment over the internet. It worked great. And as when the network failed, instead of waiting for the network to fix itself or going in and helping fix the network, we bailed on the network and tried to centralize development, and that was an utter disaster. It meant that corporations all of a sudden were putting a pile of money into the development, and when a corporation puts money into something, what does it want to get back out? It wants to get value out. And the value that the corporations thought they had was leverage and influence and control, and that was a disaster. Um, it basically uh, it led, I believe it led directly to the Unix Wars, or at least uh, contributed greatly to the Unix Wars, which led to the demise of all of the great Unix workstation vendors in that particular product line. So yes, don't do that. Um, uh, and the other problem, of course, was that uh, smaller contributors uh, like universities, individuals, small companies were basically locked out of the development process. They had no ability to contribute. 
Um, the other, the other thing that we've learned over a long time is that we've built kind of the simplest system we could possibly get away with. You've seen all of those different window, all those different uh, desktop environments. They're all implemented on top of regular X. There's no magic extensions. There's nothing unusual in those. We've worked to make all those things possible, but all of that, uh, all of that amazing diversity of artistic expression and usability and experiments and device scale, all that has been made possible because X doesn't try to enforce any particular usability or any particular style on the application developer. So you look at a system like uh, Windows, well Windows reinvents itself every couple of years and application developers have to come in and rewrite their applications for the new environment. We don't require that you do that. I can run, I can run 30 year old applications on a modern version of X and they work just fine. So we've allowed for incremental uh, modification and improvements to the system while providing backward compatibility for a very, very long time. Um, and of course, uh, we think about uh, rewriting uh, the Linux Windows system on a regular basis. We're in the middle of trying to do it again with Wayland. Um, we've tried this four or five times, and the problem is, is that X is kind of good enough in most ways, and the resistance to change is really high. Uh, starting from scratch is really hard. Uh, we're trying to make it more possible by moving stuff out of X and into the underlying operating system, but still there's great resistance and there's a huge wealth of applications that run great on X today. So who is excited about moving? Why well, the people doing the development of new Windows systems? Go for it, guys. Maybe they'll succeed. Um, and that's really what I had to say today. Thanks very much for letting me come and talk to you. And we have a, a couple of minutes for questions for me, and then we have our fine pan. Yeah, you have a question? I was curious, how and maybe why did X386 become obsolete? Uh, there was some politics. Uh, the organiz the, uh, uh, one of the major reasons was that the, uh, the control of the source code was, was in the same hands of the control of the corporation, X386. And so there wasn't this separation between who was managing the development of the code and who's managing the corporation. Um, and the corporation membership was fixed. You couldn't change the. You couldn't change who was in, in control of it because of the corporation bylaws. So you know, kind of a mistake in organizing that particular corporation. When they started, they had no idea it was going to become relevant. They were nobodies, right? They had been shunned and abused by the the rest of the X world for years and years and years. They needed a place to put the. They needed a corporation to own machines and own a domain and that kind of stuff. And they structured this thing in such a way that it was effectively impossible for it to grow into becoming something that could support uh, broader Linux uh, Windows system development. Question? Can you say anything about the previous CMS, like W? Oh, sure. I didn't even think anybody remembered W. So at Stanford University in the, in the mid-80s, uh, they were working on uh, a networked uh, distributed operating system called the vKernel. And it was a message passing uh, uh, kernel over the Ethernet, because uh, Ethernet was invented at uh, Xerox Park, uh, which is next to Stanford. Um, and they wrote this message passing based operating system called V. Um, and they wanted to have a Windows system for that. So they wrote the V graphics terminal system, or VGTS. And that was the graphics that we ran on V for years and years and years. Um, and then Paul Vixie in 83, 84, um, decided that he wanted something a little more competent than VGTS, which really was like multiple uh, dumb terminals on your screen uh, with all kinds of crazy requirements. And he wrote a new Windows system called V. And so, of course, the Windows system he wrote for V, the, vir the, uh, the what, V was like the virtual operating system, or the, I don't know what V stood for. Um, he wrote the W window system. And the W window system was uh, designed to work in the V environment with its very lightweight message passing. So it was entirely synchronous. You do a W create window call and it would synchronously talk between the, the host running the application and the host running the window system over the network with these cute little packets. Um, and that worked great in the V system, uh, but when uh, Bob Scheifler at MIT needed a Windows system to do his Argus development in the Laboratory for Computer Science. They looked at W and they got it running in Unix and it was like, yeah, this is kind of cute, but it's really slow because Unix sucks at networking, uh, especially in 1986. And so Bob took W and took a lot of the same semantics out of that and rewrote it a little bit. And of course, what did he choose for the name? Well, you've got the V, the v kernel and the W window system running on V. So of course, he picked the next letter, the X window system. 
uh, thus uh, cementing probably one of the worst free software name choices in history, which is to pick the first metasyntactic variable name for the name of your project. Um, X1 through X10 uh, were run internally at MIT for Project Athena, um, and a few people took uh, a few of those versions outside of MIT. It was all free software at the time, but we didn't know what free software meant. Um, and then eventually DEC got a hold of X version 10 um, and decided, oh, we need a Windows system for our new Unix workstations, and we don't want to write our own, and we certainly wouldn't want to use the one from Sun. Uh, so they started using X10, uh, and they were collaborating. So DEC and MIT were then collaborating because they were both in Massachusetts. So that's how we got from uh, the V kernel through the W window system to the X window system and all the way through the early versions of the X window system. And then X11 was, uh, X11 was like uh, a bunch of these companies that were starting to think about productizing X10 said, wait a minute, X10 really sucks. And they went in and just spent like six months sitting in conference room discussing how to build the perfect window system. So it is very much designed before it was implemented uh, based on the experience of a lot of people that had used X. Um, one of the big gaps was that nobody in the room knew anything about computer graphics at all. <laughs> okay, so you're writing a window system. Well, it turns out that a window system is mostly about system parts and not so much about graphics parts. So the fact that they didn't know anything about graphics was bad, and it took us a long time to recover from that, but it wasn't a fatal flaw. We managed to make competent applications in spite of the really horrible graphics library. So... Other questions? Well, thanks for coming, and I hope there's plenty of pizza for everybody. And I think we have a panel session? Yep. Okay, let's do that.